the first lesson this morning is from 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This morning is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 13, starting at verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was near. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Seal for your house will, be cons will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple in, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews replied, This temple has been under construction for 46 years and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remember that he had said this, and they believe the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. We give thanks. Did I read the right story? I think I did. It says John. Yeah. Gospel of John. And this is the Bible, the gathering of books where we learn about God. But this doesn't sound like the Jesus that I know. This is a crazy, violent man that yells and takes things and makes a whip of cords. This is not the Christ that we know, right? The Christ that we know is the one that says, love your neighbor. If somebody's trying to take your jacket, also give them or give her your shirt. The concept of put the other cheek, that's the Jesus that I know, right? This is not the Jesus that we know. Or is it? Who is this violent man? Is it possible that is the same Jesus? If you think you know everything about Jesus, you started with the wrong foot. Jesus often is like a puzzle that is meant to be enjoyed, not solved. If you think that you know all the rules and that you know the final outcome, I'm here to tell you, beware, because you might think you know, but often Jesus throws you a curveball, just like he's throwing us a curveball right now. Who is this Jesus, and why is he behaving like this? Now, I talk about a curveball. Now, if you don't know how to hit a curveball, you strike out. 
That is as simple as it comes. Now, please, please, do not hear me saying that Jesus wants to strike you out. That is not what I'm saying. Remember that Jesus is your mentor. Jesus is your teacher. Meaning that Jesus is your coach. And your coach is throwing you a curveball so you may learn how to hit a curveball. Because when life is pitching against you, the real game of life, when it throws you a curveball called cancer, or throws you a curveball of the death of your spouse, or divorce, Jesus is teaching you how to hit them out. How to be victorious. Jesus is not out to get you. Yet he behaves like this. Going back to our story, Jesus is back in Jerusalem for the celebration of the Passover. In case you don't remember, the Passover is almost like the celebration of their Independence Day. It happens in the early spring. They celebrate how they are not slaves in Egypt anymore. So they gather all together and they go to Jerusalem and they worship together. Because that's how they celebrate their salvation. So we understand that this is not the first time Jesus is at the temple in Jerusalem. So it is not the first time that Jesus sees what's happening in the temple. Now, we have to agree that Jesus' reaction is not a normal WWJD reaction. Now, Jesus behaves like this in one or two situations in the Bible. I say once or twice, but they're all referring within the temple. Now, there is an argument between scholars that there is two times of cleaning of the temple, not one. They happen, and they divided them like this. The Synoptic Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they talk about Jesus clean out the temple right before his crucifixion. John speaks about the clean out the temple at the beginning of his ministry. So there is at least twice or once, depending on how you look at it, that Jesus reacts like this in a very not Jesus way. Because, you know, you have to understand, Jesus is the only one that often comes with a story or with an insight or a parable. That's how Jesus teaches. But in this particular situation, he reacts like you and me when we are upset. Throw our arms in the gray air. I mean, we don't make whips, but sometimes we use our tongue as whips. Now, if Jesus knows that love is what changes the world? Why is he acting in a violent way? For me, that's foolish. Jesus was acting in a foolish way. And I'm not committing blasphemy here. If you read back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25, the Bible says that a possible foolishness of God is wiser than any man or woman on planet Earth. So there is a possibility. Now, realizing that this might have been a foolish act of Jesus on behalf of humanity, and that it is good. Whatever Jesus does, it is good. It makes me think about this passage in a different way.
One of the first things that I realize is that Jesus is reacting like this for this particular purpose. The scripture says that he makes a whip of cords. Does the Bible say that Jesus hits anybody with it? No. The Bible says that Jesus makes the whip of cords and draws and droves the cattle and the sheep away from the temple. So Jesus is really not behaving in a violent way. Jesus is just calling attention to himself. See, I don't know if you have ever been in a public market where there are animals. But there's confusion. There is noise, and everybody's being loud. My tone of voice is normal. So if Jesus was going to tell you how upset he was about this particular reason, and everyone is just making noise, you know what? Actually, let's do that. I'm going to ask you to count from one to five, really, really loud. And I'm going to try to tell you a secret. Okay? And see if you can tell me if you can hear it. All right. So at the count of three, you're going to count really loud up to five. I'm going to turn my mic out, off. All right? One, two, three, four. One. I said loud. One, two, three, four, five. If Jesus was going to capture attention, he needed to find the appropriate tool to capture your attention. Back then, it was the whip. Remember slavery? The person that has a whip is a person with power, is a person that everybody's paying attention to. Right now, might be the mic. Today, my whip is my mic because you are paying attention to me. This teaches something important to us as a church. If you are upset and you have something important to tell your congregation, it's not enough just being upset. You need to find the right tool to let your church know that you're upset. And there's room for improvement. You have to make sure people hear you when you're upset. Because if you, not cons if you do not consider the reason why you're upset important, nobody else will. And schedules are crazy. So you need to make sure you're capturing people's attention. Just to be clear, I am not telling you to go out and make a whip and come to church with a whip. We'll call 911. But if you are upset about something that is important to you, why are you not sharing that with the church? Which leads me to the second thing that I learned from this passage. When you are upset, who are you telling that you're upset? Do we see Jesus telling the disciples that he was upset? No. To whom does Jesus say that he's upset about the market that is happening in the temple? To the people who are doing it. Jesus didn't bother in telling the disciples, hey, Peter, you know what? I'm really upset about them selling animals. And they would have a conversation, and probably Peter would agree with Jesus. Oh, yeah, they were not supposed to do that. But would that change anything? No. When you're upset, you need to make sure you're telling people, and that you're telling the right people. Because what is, what is the point of you telling the person right next to you if the person right next to you cannot do anything about it? Now, if I do something wrong that upsets you, I want you to come and tell me so I can improve or explain my situation or my reaction so we can talk. 
That is what the text is teaching us right now. Jesus called the attention of the leaders and then told them what was wrong with it, what was happening with the church. Last but not least, there's a third thing that I learned from this text. And it's about patience. See, Jesus is upset. Jesus finds the right tool. Jesus tells the right person, the right people. Yet he's patient. Because didn't, things didn't change in the temple for years before the cruci- after the crucifixion. Jesus, the Son of God, was patient. Why are we not patient? Why are we not patient with our church? I mean, it is just insanely easy to quit on church right now. And it shouldn't be like that. I don't like this. I don't like that. Well, I'm going to quit. I'm just going to go to a different church. Or I'm just not going to go to church at all. And there are very good reasons to be upset. But there is no good reason to quit on church. Not one. Remembering that church is not about you. Church is about God. When you see something that troubles you in your church, tell the right person so something can be done and then be patient. Because even though we might not be selling cattle and sheep right now in worship, I am sure we're still making the same mistake right now. Somehow, I don't know it yet, Believe me, if I knew, I would change it. That's why we need to be in community. And you need to tell me, what do you see that can be improved? Jesus is still waiting for us to make the changes within our place of worship. So we can make an impact out there. From the gospel we learn about encouraging one another and forgiving one another and working together for one another, all three for the glory of God. From the Gospels, we do not learn to quit on church because not even Jesus himself has quit on church. He's still struggling with us every day. So may we learn to find the right tool to share our concerns. May we address the right people, the right person. And may we be patient with one another as Christ is patient with us. Amen.